Hello and welcome back to the second part of the Gilliam talk. Now as I said in the first part, um, the second part is going to be much shorter and essentially what I'm going to do is just going to introduce a few concepts to you that are useful to know or have heard at least before you start doing the first practical. And these are hypothesis testing or whatever the null hypothesis is or the null distribution is. Uh, we're going to mention a few things about the residuals that also might be useful to know and finally I'm going to you know, explain what multiple comparison correction is and why that, in why that is necessary in new imaging. So uh, the T statistic, as we talked about in the first part of the talk, looks like this. T is the parameter estimate divided by the uncertainty of the parameter estimate. Now let's say for the sake of an argument here that this particular parameter is the parameter pertaining to the word generation. Um, again, from the from the first part of the talk, um, and as I said in the first part of the talk, if we see a large value of beta, we think that that particular voxel that generated that t value that generated that beta is probably interested in word generation, and a large value of beta then also indicates a large value of the t statistic. So. If we see a large value, we say, OK, this voxel is probably interested in word generation. But what constitutes a large value? Um, that's an important question. So what we're usually doing then, or what we're doing in classical testing, is that we're formulating a null, null hypothesis. And that null hypothesis is typically the precise opposite of what we're actually hoping for or what we actually want. So the null hypothesis here is that beta is actually zero, and as you can see, this is the true state of effects. This is not the parameter estimates of beta. We say the null hypothesis that beta really is zero. Now, if beta truly was zero, what would we expect the t-statistic in such a voxel to be? Well, we would expect it to be zero, but because of the uncertainty in the estimates and this uncertainty in in the standard deviation of that uncertainty here as well. Um, that means it's not always going to be zero. You know, it's, you know, zero is the most likely value, but you know, if you see over here, so this is probably t value of one, and that's also you know not that unlikely. So um, and this is what the null distribution is doing. So the null distribution is a distribution that is known for these statistics like the t statistics T statistic or F statistic. Um, and it gives us, it sort of essentially tells us how likely the different values of T are under the null distribution, under the null hypothesis, i.e., provided the beta is zero. Now, this is useful because we can use this then to take the value we actually observe, the T statistics we actually observe in a given voxel, and we can then ask the question. Now, how likely or how probable is it that we would observe a t-value this large or larger if indeed the null hypothesis was true? And we do that by simply integrate up the area under the curve in this null distribution to the right or to the more extreme part of the distribution to the right of the observed t-value. Um, and then this then constitutes the p-value of this t-statistic, i.e. the likelihood or the probability of finding a value this large or larger, provided that the null hypothesis is true. Um, and then what we typically do is we say, OK, there is some p-value that we consider to be so unlikely um, that if we encounter this, we're going to say, oh, I don't think the null hypothesis is true. And therefore, that will lead us to reject the null hypothesis and instead say that, OK, we think that there is something here. The t-statistic is significantly different from zero, i.e. we have an activation in that voxel. And this p-value is typically 0 0.05, but <coughs> obviously that is, is, is um, arbitrary, so it could also take other values. Another thing you might want to be aware of is that what you're going to see in, in most of the statistical images in FSL is something called a Z distribution. Um, and the reason for this is that a T distribution, um, you know, there, there is a whole family of T distributions. So if you get a T value of 1.5, for example, then the interpretation of that in terms of how unlikely that is, or in terms of the P value, will depend very much on 
the degrees of freedom of that t-distribution and the degrees of freedom that is essentially the number of independent measurements that you had when calculating that t-value. So if you have a t-value of 2.5 for example the interpretation of that is going to be very different if it is a t-distribution with 2 degrees of freedom or if it is a t-distribution with 100 degrees of freedom. So therefore what we do is we do a probability deserving transform from the t value to a z value and the z value is simply a value from a standard normal distribution um, i.e. the normal distribution with a mean of zero and standard deviation of one and we're doing this transformation such that the p value is preserved and that means that instead of having a t value that depends on the, uh, the details of that particular experiment we get a z value that is always that you can always interpret in the same way now, the next thing we need to talk a little bit about is the residuals and things we can do with the residuals. So you probably remember that um, MJ mentioned high-pass filtering. Um, and what high-pass filtering is, it is a filter that takes the data and, and the design, and from that it removes anything that is a slow drift, i.e. that has a slow variation over time. Hence the name high pass, so things that change rapidly over time, is passed through this filter unchanged, but things that change slowly over time will be filtered away by this filter. Um, <clears throat> and the reason we want to do this, if you look at this example here, you can see a raw signal, um, and this has this on off on off kind of behavior that may, makes us think that okay there's probably something going on in this voxel there's an activation going on here but you can see there's also a slow drift and unless we actually filter out that slow drift that slow drift is going to end up in the residuals and that means that the t value is going to get smaller and we're going to lose sensitivity whereas after high pass filtering we can see we remove this but we still have all of this on-off variation that we're interested in and that indicates an activation. Now what's important to know here is that you need to be careful when you choose the cut-off value for the high-pass filter. And it's actually really, really easy. So if you do have a sort of uh, an uh, epoch-related uh, design, i.e. sort of a boxcar EV, then what you do is you choose your cut-off to correspond to the shortest period that you have in your data. So here what we have is you have off and we have on and the period of the total time of that is 100 seconds. So that's the period of this data. So you choose a cutoff of 100 seconds and you'll be fine. And that means that you will remove slow drifts, but you will leave in all the interesting experimentally induced variance. Now what happens if you if you don't do this, if you, if you have a too short cutoff, so over here what we have is an example of a, uh, again, a boxcar, an epoch-related design, uh, but now with a period of 250 seconds, and if you then choose a cutoff of 100 seconds, we can see that we have removed interesting variance, i.e. we have diminished the difference between the off and the on periods, the off period and the on period, there. whereas if we use a cutoff of 250 seconds, we can see that that difference between the on-off periods are preserved, so we haven't actually lost any sensitivity. Right, the next thing we're going to talk about is something called autocorrelation or colored fMRI noise. It's a it's quite a hard concept to get um, your head around. So what I usually do is I try to illustrate this with an everyday example that actually has autocorrelation and, and that we have an intuition for it having an autocorrelation and that is the weather. Uh, but first, the reason for doing this is so as you know, um, in the t-statistic, the t-statistic depends on the number of measurements you have. If you have very few measurements, the t-statistic is going to be small. If you have a lot of measurements, the t-statistic is going to be large. So that sort of goes directly into the calculation of the t-statistic. So it's important to know how many measurements you actually have. Right. So the example I use is weather, um, and this this sort of a uh, hypothetical uh, scenario I, I, I will tell you about is me wanting to figure out, okay, is the weather better in San Diego, California, or is it better in Oxford, United Kingdom? 
And the way I've done that is I've taken eight consecutive days and observed the weather in San Diego, and eight consecutive days and observed the weather in California, sorry, <laughs> in Oxford, UK. Um, and so I've got eight months, I've got eight measurements of these, so 16 in total. I'm going to estimate two means. I've got 14 degrees of freedom. And as you can see, the weather is better in Oxford. Right. And you probably all think, well, OK, that makes sense. You know, he's got 16 measurements and you know, he's, he's done this quite carefully. And, and you know, okay, maybe we maybe we should believe this. But if instead I had said, well, OK, what I did was I took eight independent measurements of the weather in San Diego and eight independent measurements of the weather in Oxford. And I did this by observing the weather in San Diego at eight consecutive seconds. So now, 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 rain, 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 rain. And you would just think, well, that, that's bonkers. I mean, they, these are not eight independent measurements. I mean, that's not how the weather change. The weather doesn't change from second to second. And actually, it doesn't change from day to day either. So what we're having here is not eight independent measurements. Actually, it's maybe two or possibly three independent measurements because weather is something that changes gradually and slowly over time. I mean, if you're going to try and predict the weather tomorrow, the best prediction for the weather tomorrow is going to be that the weather tomorrow is going to be the same as the weather today. And the same is true for the bold signal in the brain. It doesn't change from one second to the next. And the reason it doesn't change from one second to the next is it's mediated through blood, through something that it takes time to get into the brain, takes time to, to sort of blow up the vessels, and takes time to, to clear from the brain as well. So it's something that changes slowly over time. And that means that if you have a time series of 200 measurements, you might think that you have 200 independent measurements. But depending on the TR, you might not. You might have... 150 measurements or 100 measurements. So this is what outer correlation means. I, that means that consecutive measurements are correlated with each other, not independent. And this is something that is taken care of for you by feet. So you don't need to do anything about it, but it's good to be aware that it's, it's, it's there in the background. So the final thing we want to talk about is thresholding or multiple comparison um, multiple comparison problem. So what we have here is a said map and this is a simulated set map that I made myself. So I know that the null hypothesis is true everywhere, i.e. there are no activations here. And then I used the null hypothesis and the null distribution I talked about before. So this is a null distribution. And I will threshold this at the 0 0.05 level, i.e. there's only a 5% risk of me rejecting the null hypothesis if the null hypothesis is really true. But then if I look at my set map, wow, I know there are no activations here, but we have 16 clusters constituting 288 voxels above this threshold. That's a lot of false positives. But if you think about it, it's not really that surprising. Because what we have done is for each and every voxel we've said, okay, I am going to reject the null hypothesis at the 0 0.05 level. And that means in 5% of the cases, we are going to be wrongly rejecting the null hypothesis. And that translates to 5% of the voxels. So this is not what we want. What we want is we want to control the error or the, 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 the error rate at an experiment level rather than a voxel level. So what we want is, so what we have here now is we have 20 of these set maps and each of these set maps for each of these set maps the null hypothesis is true there is no activation anywhere so what we want to find is the threshold so that when we apply it to all of these maps we will only find a single voxel in only one of these 20 maps that are above that threshold because if we do that then we have controlled uh, the false positive rates on an experiment level, and we have corrected for multiple comparisons. Now, I should mention that both these concepts of null hypothesis, null distribution, and multiple comparison um, correction, we will talk about that in a lot more detail in the inference talk uh, later on in the course. Right, so just to summarize, we test for an effect through a null hypothesis that we might reject. The null hypo hypothesis is rejected if an observed statistic is too unlikely, 
and when we are, are, are so assessing what's too unlikely, we are using the null distribution as our tool for that. And when thresholding the number of false positives, when yeah, when thresholding uh, these images, we need to control the number of false positives on an experiment level, i.e. across the entire brain. And yeah, that's all for, for this talk. Thank you very much.